Now, the next part of the topic really requires you to give some explanations about different trends we see in the periodic table. Now, for a start, we never explain a trend like ionization energy using another trend like electronegativity or atomic radius. These trends need to be explained using the basic principles. Now, you do need to know the definition of ionization and electronegativity, but essentially ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from the furthest shell. Now, you can actually end up removing all of the electrons from an atom and each electron removed. You go from the first ionization, second ionization, third ionization energy, and so on, until you've removed all the electrons. And it's in a gaseous state. We're talking about one mole of those atoms involved. So the higher the energy, the more difficult it is to remove that electron. And that should make sense intuitively. If the energy isn't very high, it doesn't take much to remove those. And obviously, as it's taking energy to do this, these are all endothermic processes we're having to put energy in to do this. So all these energies would expect to be, you know, positive in terms of the entropy involved. Now, electronegativity is the attraction an atom has for the electron in a shared covalent bond. So again, this is about it's attractive, it's attracting the electron in the outer shell. And atomic radius is what it says, just the radius of the atom, the outer electrons. So as we go across a period, it's helpful to look at the things that change. Now, as we're going across a period, now I'm just choosing this one here from sodium going on through to argon. What's actually happening here as we go across? We get more protons. Okay, well, that's great. Now, protons have a positive charge, and this is sometimes called the nuclear charge. And then as we're going across, we're also getting more electrons, but we're actually, we're in the same energy level. And that's kind of important. Now there's a concept that comes up called electron shielding. Now essentially this is kind of like if you went to the beach with a bunch of friends and sat around a big fire. Now there might be eight friends around that fire and then some friends might be able on the outside of that fire. So they'd be shielded from that fire because there are people in the way. And it's a little bit like that. As you change from one energy level to another, the further you go out, the more those outer electrons are shielded from that nuclear charge and the less attraction they feel. So the important thing to realize here is that energy level and electron shielding go hand in hand. So as you change from, for instance, this energy level, where you'd expect them to be all in the same energy level, also have the same electron shielding, um, if you were to go down to a, the next energy level, for instance, to the one there where we've got potassium and calcium and so on, that would be a, further out, you'd be in a different energy level and there'd be more electron shielding um, for, say, potassium compared to sodium, okay? And there'd be, um, and this would go on and so on across. Now, the fourth thing we need to consider is the electrostatic attraction. An electrostatic attraction is just really the attraction um, that the uh, protons or the nuclear charge has for those electrons. So as we go across, what we find happens is we get an increase in the nuclear charge, an increase in the number of protons at positive charge. And this is in some respects like building a fire. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And they're in the same energy level, so they're not further out. Um, the electron shielding is the same. So that electrostatic attraction is actually increasing. Now when I was in year 13, I used to think that the number of protons just cancelled with the number of electrons. I was looking at it like some kind of maths calculation. It's not like that. It's really just a matter of the attraction getting stronger as you go across. And if the electrostatic attraction gets stronger as you go across a row, what happens is the radius is going to get smaller. It's kind of like if you imagine it being a really strong magnet and it gets stronger as you go across 
and the electrons of our iron filings are going to be held tighter and tighter and tighter as you go across. Now that's not a great analogy because of course the iron filings would eventually end up being would be just you know stuck to the magnet, but you should get the idea of what I'm talking about hopefully. But what I really want you to understand is this is how all these properties are related. The atomic radius as you go across, well, it gets smaller. Okay? It's getting smaller because that electrostatic attraction is getting stronger as you go across. That electro electrons are getting held tighter. And if they're getting tighter, how much energy do you think it's going to take to actually remove the outer electron? For instance, if you compare sodium with chlorine. Well, because chlorine is further to the right, more protons as you go across, stronger electrostatic attraction, it's going to be harder to remove the electron from chlorine than it is from sodium. And therefore, smaller radius, more ionization energy. Electronegativity, that attraction for the outer electron in a shared covalent bond. It's also going to increase as you go across. So what I want you to see is that the same reason that the radius gets smaller is the same reason that the electronegativity increases and it's the same reason that the ionization energy increases. This is really helpful for answering questions because in effect, for the same question, which could be why is magnesium's um, ionization energy lower than that of sulfur, you could equally say why is magnesium's radius bigger than that of um, sulfur, you could equally say why is the electronegativity of sulfur greater than magnesium? These are all the same question. And they're going to be answered using these basic kind of ideas here. That the reason the ionization energy increases is the same reason that electronegativity increases, is the same reason that the atomic radius is getting smaller. And you would answer every single one of those questions talking about these things. How the nuclear charge is increasing because getting more protons how the energy level is the same, how the electron shielding is the same. The reason that's important is we're just pointing out that it is the same, so we don't have to worry about it too much. And the electrostatic attraction is getting stronger, it's increasing, and that's the kind of key thing there, and that's why the radius is getting smaller, and that's why the ionization energy is getting greater, and that's why the electron negativity is getting greater if we compare all of the atoms going across, that these increase as we go across, okay? Now, if we were to compare oxygen and sulfur, the first thing we'd notice is that this oxygen, compared to sulfur, is in a lower energy level. Sulfur is one energy level down, therefore, um, there's a few things we can say. One, and again we look at those same things, we're looking at protons or nuclear charge. Okay, alright. Okay, we're about to fit it in, but anyway, you get the idea. And the second thing we're going to be looking at is energy level. The third thing we're going to be looking at is electron shielding. And the fourth thing we're going to be looking at is electrostatic attraction. Electrostatic attraction. These are the basic things that you generally talk about in the majority of the examples. So what's changing here? Well, the number of protons as we go from oxygen to sulfur is increasing. The energy, so you'd actually think that would increase the electrostatic attraction, right? But the energy level, it's actually further out, so this has changed. It's gone up, it's in a higher energy level, it's in sulfur. That's one level down in the periodic table. The electron shielding must have increased as well. The electrons in sulfur are one whole energy level further. I mean, I'll try and do a nifty diagram here that we'll see. A very simple one, one of the other ones. Okay, so if, you know, if we're going further out, we've now got more, if we're now out here, I know this isn't complete, if we're out here in sulfur now, we've got more shielding, you know, here between this and the nucleus. So going further out means there's more shielding. Terrible diagram, I know, what I'm doing with this. And so we've got a couple of things going on here. We think that the increase in number of protons would be, you know, maybe enough to make the radius small, but what it turns out is that the simple fact that the energy level um, is a higher one, there's more electro electron shielding, and this also means that it's the distance is the physical distance is further. 
that means that despite the increase in the number of protons, the fact that we've dropped that energy level and we're further out means that the electrostatic attraction is actually going to decrease. Now that means the atomic radius is going to be smaller, oh sorry, bigger, because the outer electrons aren't held as tightly because of this decrease in electrostatic attraction, primarily due to the fact that it's an energy level that's further out and uh, the electron shielding is going to increase. So that, therefore, what can you say about the electronegativity? Well, if the atomic radius has got bigger, that means the electrons aren't being as tightly held, so you'd expect the electronegativity to increase. And you'd also think that, well, removing an electron from this atom is going to be easier because it's not held as tightly. So again, all of these properties, these, sorry, these trends can be explained using these basic, I call them first principles, but they're just the basic way of looking at atoms. Okay? So, again, a lot of the questions you should be able to answer using that. Okay, what about ions? Well, if we go from sulfur to sulfur 2 minus, again, if we look at protons, well, that stayed the same, obviously. And the fact that it's added two electrons, it's still in the same energy level. And, you know, the electron shielding would be the same. But the thing they really want you to talk about with a negative ion, in terms of the radius, for instance, is that it's got bigger. And it's got bigger because we've got an extra two electrons. The main thing you need to talk about is that electron-electron repulsion. You put more negatively charged electrons together, they're going to repel more. The number of protons hasn't stayed the, has stayed the same. The number of electrons has increased, which means that extra repulsion is a significant factor. So for negative ions, the radius is always going to be bigger. Now, if we look at positive ions, well, we've still got the same number of protons, but the main thing here, if you lose an electron, you actually drop an energy level and you're in a closer in orbital. And that means electrostatic attraction is going to increase because now you've got still the same number of protons, but in this case, because the electrons are now going to be closer, you've got less electron shielding, distance has decreased, these ions are always going to be much smaller. Now, this would be a typical case. Which is going to be the smallest? I'm not saying which is the smallest. We're really asking, in some respects, um, which is going to have the, well, which is going to have the greatest electrostatic charge, perhaps, but it's a little bit more complex than that. Now, if we look at all of these, one thing that they've actually all got in common is they have the same number of electrons. And there's a special word for that. We say that they're isoelectronic. Okay? Now, this one, though, has 11 protons. This one has 10 protons. And this one has got 9 protons. We've got that extra electron there as well, don't we? But isoelectronic. So, sodium would actually have the smallest radius because it's got more protons, so it's got an increase in nuclear charge with the same number of protons. Neon would be next. And finally, fluorine, it's got the weakest um, you know, electrostatic attraction due to having um, an extra electron more repulsion and having a smaller number of protons. So that would come last. Now, if you understand that, you've got a reasonable understanding of how this works. Okay? Now, occasionally there are unusual cases or trends that you're asked to explain. Now, if there is something you can't explain, always use electron configuration to help you. Now, if you go from, if we fill these in a normal way, 1s, and we go to 2s, now we're in the, the 2 energy level here, right? And we put one another electron there. Now, at this moment, we're going to be going from beryllium to boron. Now, I would expect, as you go from beryllium to boron, for the radius to actually get smaller, because you're getting more protons and 
and the same energy level and same electron shielding, so greater electrostatic attraction. But it doesn't. Now these are little variations. The trend going across a period is that they get smaller. But occasionally we get these kind of like blips where it doesn't go quite to plan. Now the reason is, is that we've gone from a 2s to a 2p orbital, and the 2p orbital is in a higher energy level. So because this is further out, now the ionization energy isn't going to be you know, quite as um, high as we'd think it would be. We'd think it would increase as you go across, just the same as we would also think the radius would get smaller. So some of the unusual trends are due to the fact that we're going from an S to a P orbital here. We'd normally expect that to be, as I've said before, but I'm just going to repeat it, we'd normally expect the electrostatic attraction to increase as we go across. But because we're now moving a little bit further out into a P orbital, we're going to find that that causes it to have, um, going to the high energy level, to have less electrostatic attraction and so we don't get the findings that we normally see. We could explain it in that way. Now if we were to carry on, and this would be the same in the 3s and the 3p, I'm just choosing to use the 2s and 2p orbitals. These electrons now do this. They go into the orbitals that give them the lowest um, amount of energy, the most stability, where there's just a single electron in each of these p orbitals. So we've now got seven electrons, but when we go to eight electrons, which I'll do now, That has now paired up, and those paired up electrons in there will repel, and that means that even though we're continuing to add protons and we're going across, the fact that that electron has now been added to an orbital where it has to pair up means that it's actually going to, again, be further out, and we're not going to quite see the pattern that we'd normally see. So the point I'm making here, obviously, is, well, hoping, hoping it's obvious anyway, is that if you're asked about any unusual trends, the first thing is to do the electron configuration, which you may in fact have already done in NCA because they may have structured the question to give you that, is to look at are you going from an S to P orbital? And if you are, say 2S to 2P, then this is in a higher energy orbital. And that would explain anything unusual in the trend. Second are electrons having to pair up. And this is usually going to be, a, say, a 2p or 3p orbital. And if that's the case, that also means it's going to be further out and it's going to have less electrostatic attraction because of the electron-electron propulsion going on. So they explain some of the unusual trends that you can see. Now, to summarise, first of all, in any problem, when it's going to be asked some you know, problems you're going to have to talk about a trend, you state what the trend is. Now, you should know the trend. So, for instance, with radius, as you go across the road, the radius gets smaller. This is a general trend. There are some little blips and exceptions that I talked about before, okay? And actually, as you go up, it also tends to get smaller included to say as you go down it gets bigger, right? I just realised this time frame may not be in the right place, so I'm just going to redraw it here. Now, as you go across it gets smaller, and the periodic table as you go up it also gets smaller, okay? Just the same as if you go down a row, the opposite view of course it gets bigger, which we expect. That's with radius, right? Now the same reason it's getting smaller is the same reason that as we go across, if we're talking about ionization energy, it's going to increase. And just the same as if you go up this way, it's going to increase going up this way. So ionization energy would increase going up here, and it would increase going across that way. Electronegativity would also, I don't know why I wrote that out, but anyway, would also increase going up this way in the periodic table, and it would increase going up this way. I mean, there's different ways of describing this using the same things. You could say the radius gets smaller going across this way. And as we go down, obviously it's going to get bigger. So 
if you're asked about a question, generally state the trend. So you might say, for instance, as you go across the periodic table, the radius gets smaller. As you go down a group, it gets bigger. Or as you go across the periodic table, the ionization energy increases. As you go down the ionization in a group, it gets smaller. There's different ways of just stating the trend, but just state the trend, assuming you know it. The other thing is when you talk about um, protons and a nuclear charge, you, that's the first thing you talk about usually. You talk about is it increasing, is it decreasing? And then you talk about energy level and the distance it is out. So if it's in the same energy level, I'm assuming it's the same distance from the nucleus. It's going into a higher energy orbital. It's going to be further away and it's going to be more electron shielding. So you relate those two together. So supposed to be electrostatic attraction there, so you're kind of putting those two together. Because it's these two here that dictate what the electrostatic attraction is going to be. So, yeah, okay, well, if protons is increasing, but we're going to be going further out, the end result could be that the electrostatic, in fact, most of the time it is, is going to be decreasing. So you relate those to electrostatic attraction, and then you relate that to the trend. An example would be, you know, as you, you know, discuss why the ionization energy of fluorine is greater than that of chlorine. You'd say, well, fluorine does have enough more protons compared to chlorine. The nuclear charge is greater. However, chlorine is one energy level further away. The distance is greater. There's more electron shielding. And therefore, the electrostatic attraction is going to be less for chlorine and therefore the ionization energy for chlorine is going to be lower. Okay? One final point, and that's E and C, effective nuclear charge. If an electron is further away from the nucleus, it doesn't feel all of the nuclear charge. There's been some shielding going on from those inner orbitals. So we say the effective nuclear charge it feels can be whatever value. And that just means it's been diminished because of electron shielding. It's not feeling the full nuclear charge. That's just a side. Now I'm hoping that's made giving explanations a little bit clearer.